Hello and a warm welcome to another edition of To The Point. On the show this week, distinguished career diplomat and former foreign secretary to the government of India, Kaval Sibal. Welcome, sir, and to The Point. Thank you. Uh, given the fact that the Doklam standoff is almost over, at least it is perceived to be over, do we read this as a diplomatic victory for India? Well, first of all, it is over. It's not almost over, it is over. And number two, it certainly is a diplomatic success for India because we've been saying all along that there can only be a diplomatic solution to the crisis and there should be a restoration of the status quo ante. And this is precisely what has happened. So in terms of uh, what our achievement uh, of our goals through dialogue and uh, diplomacy rather than uh, through an actual conflict, uh, certainly redounds to the credit of our diplomacy and is a success. But I would caution uh, the government and uh, even the public opinion in India and the press not to project it too much as a great Indian victory because there's no sense in uh, humiliating uh, China because uh, the so-called loss of face uh, is very important for uh, the Chinese. So if you are saying that we should not over project the moment, the India should not over project the moment, so how does one interpret the magnitude of the victory? Are we in a position to say that it's a crushing defeat for China or for Xi Jinping? Do we say that? No, I wouldn't mind if uh, we also said that uh, we have all along shown a great deal of maturity okay. and wisdom mm -hmm. in dealing with this crisis. And the Chinese uh, who initially were too belligerent, obnoxious, threatening us with reprisals in a most unbecoming manner, belatedly found wisdom and showed sagacity. And uh, therefore, uh, there's no harm if we also appreciate that China finally decided to also resolve this problem through diplomatic means rather than through the threats they were brandishing too liberally, I must say. But despite the fact that the Doklam standoff is over now, it has been resolved. But if I were to quote uh, the senior Colonel Wu Qian of PLA and the Defence Ministry, they've come out with a statement saying that we remind India to draw lessons from the standoff, abide by established treaties and basic principles of international law and work together with China to safeguard peace and stability along the border. Despite all the resolution, there is still a belligerence in the tone. Uh, there is a war-like rant coming from the side of Beijing. Why is that? So what is your reading on it? Because they are wounded and they are snarling. Okay. Uh, that's what it is. Uh, and they have to cater to their own domestic public opinion because they raise the temperatures so high that uh, cooling it is not going to be that easy. Uh, they climb so high that uh, there was great danger that they will fall down badly. So they have to climb down. So they have, <laughs> they have done that. And the PLA uh, colonel earlier on the whatever anniversary it was of the PLA made an extremely belligerent statement that China is uh, it's easier to move a mountain wall, but the PLA cannot be moved. So that kind of ridiculous rhetoric. So they have to say something uh, to try and retrieve uh, their, uh, their position a little bit and save themselves embarrassment. So I, if they want to release steam like this, it's all right, let them do it. But they should realize the more they talk this language, the more they are condescending, uh, the more they treat India as an inferior, it will deepen the distrust between the two countries. But picking your phrase, what you use, that it's like a steam releasing moment for them. They are doing it. They're like a wounded tiger. And obviously, they have to uh, position themselves uh, amongst the domestic uh, population. So. Is this kind of a posturing only for the domestic consumption or should India be reacting at all on this? Because obviously internationally and globally there are countries, there are smaller countries also, smaller nations also which are watching India's next move. So how does India react to this kind of a move by China? We should ignore it. After all, we ignored this ranting and raving of China for two months. So what is the compulsion now that we have got what we wanted to react? We should continue to show uh, restraint, be very calm and show confidence. And I think that has been a great success of diplomacy under Prime Minister Modi that uh, 
we have acted as a country with stronger conviction and stronger sense of self-confidence by not reacting to Chinese provocations, but being very firm uh, on the ground. Now, with regard to your question, yes, it is uh, directed at their domestic audience, certainly, because of the 19th National People's Congress, which is very critical in terms of Xi's political standing and control and power within the system. Uh, but it's also uh, intended uh, to retrieve lost ground vis-a-vis -vis their own neighbors in the South China Sea and our neighbors in South Asia, because the message that is going to them is that India now has become sufficiently self-confident to stand up to China, and they have actually compelled China to look for a diplomatic solution rather than brandishing that threat that they will once again do the 1962 on us and humiliate us. Looking at the timing, uh, when the standoff has been resolved, it coming as it does just uh, almost a week before Prime Minister Modi heads for the BRIC summit. So is it just to create a kind of a positive atmospherics that this uh, resolution has come in the fray? Or are the two nations really serious about uh, withdrawing themselves from Doklam Plateau? Oh, yes, certainly. I mean, we had no reason to go into Doklam in any case, since it is Bhutanese territory. And uh, we would not have wanted to stay on in foreign territory uh, longer than necessary. We were compelled to intervene because they were building a military road in that area, which if it got extended uh, to the uh, Jamperi Ridge, uh, would have compromised uh, the security uh, of uh, our Siliguri corridor. And we've been very clear, not now, but even in the past, that we will not allow China to cross the Torsa Nala, uh, because if they did, then they would automatically reach the Jamperi Ridge. So that's why we intervene. Uh, now, China claims this is that is its territory. Uh, they will continue to do patrolling, uh, as they have said they would. Uh, we have no problem with that, because uh, after all, we have disputed pockets with China. And China is patrolling those disputed pockets. We are also patrolling there. So this patrolling is a very different activity. Chinese media says that they will continue to patrol and, you know, they'll continue to uphold their territorial sovereignty. But at the same time, uh, India is not saying anything. If they are continuing to patrol and India says that, okay, the troops are withdrawn, then how does one read? Is it not like a, maybe a game which is, which is a draw game? How, how does one read this? Movie? Well, yes, it is in that sense a draw. We wanted a draw. We had said that let's restore up the position to what existed before June 18, which is a draw that you, you made a move, you withdraw from that move, we made a move and we will withdraw. So it's a draw. We are not entering into a clash and saying that we have won a victory over you. It's a victory in a different sense. If China had not raised the temperature so high and threatened us with reprisals, and said that you must unconditionally withdraw. Absolutely. And on their side, they say it's our territory. 1890 treaty says it's our territory. It's undisputed Chinese territory. In that sense, yes, it's India's victory. But if you look at the situation on the ground, it's a draw because both sides have uh, reverted to their previous uh, positions. With regard to patrolling, uh, China, the Chinese troops patrol uh, lots of areas that are, that are disputed between India and China on our border. And Indian patrols also uh, go into areas which we claim are ours. And you had this incident at this San Po Lake just a few days ago, uh, where the Chinese were patrolling into what we consider as the area under our control, and there was a scuffle. So th the fact that the Chinese are saying that they will continue to patrol uh, the Doklam area uh, is a challenge to Bhutanese sovereignty and it's for Bhutan then to also um, send its patrols and uh, check the Chinese patrols or tell them that they're intruding into Ch Bhutanese territory, send them protest notes as, they, as they've been doing in the past so that their claim on this territory is maintained because if they don't react, then the Chinese will get away with it. But then we have no 
a right to intervene in Doklam simply because the Chinese are patrolling there. We intervened because they were building a military road and threatening directly our Siliguri corridor. So it was became very significant for us in terms of security threats. But patrolling doesn't mean that they are going to dig themselves on the ground, station themselves permanently. Patrolling means they'll come back and go back to their headquarters. So they'll continue to, continue to do that. So I don't attach much importance to this. But the statement which came out from both sides, New Delhi and Beijing, uh, it actually did not mention anything about the fact that whether China is going to build or, or the official status of the road construction. Will China further the road construction or the basic premise of the disengagement of troops is, is, is that they will disengage the troops only on this premise. So wh how does one read that? It's very clear that uh, they have withdrawn their uh, earth moving equipment. We have said that, although we haven't said it officially, but official, uh, our official sources have already briefly pressed on this and we should take it at face value. And we have said that this has been verified. Now, we are not going to verify our own uh, withdrawal and our withdrawal of our the own. Chinese have already verified. Uh, that we, we, we verified the withdrawal of our own bulldozers. It's ridiculous. When we say it has been verified, it means that we have verified that the Chinese have withdrawn their bulldozers and earth moving equipment, which means no road building. The Chinese have also said that in view of uh, India's withdrawal, they'll make the necessary adjustments and deployments, which is a code word for saying that they're not going to build the road. Now, they know that if they start building the road again, India will intervene. Look, we are just 150 meters away from uh, this road building exercise. It will take us 15 minutes to redeploy ourselves from our present positions to which we have withdrawn on our side of the Sikkim border. It will just take us 15 minutes to redeploy ourselves there. So if they try to do anything, we'll go in again. And uh, China uh, will uh, think twice before they do that. No, I don't think that the road building is an issue as of now. Mm -hmm. In the distant future, depending on the equation between India and China, and how things pan out, if China feels it can take risks again. But for the time being, I don't think it's a problem. But if you look at the past narrative, lot of was said about how that road will be put to military use and that was that became the reason of apprehension for India. So, uh, so should we take this move as a serious one and should we really believe into what China has said that they will disengage the troops and this kind of a thing will not be repeated? You see, the, Ch the whole Chinese position on this is absolutely ridiculous. First of all, uh, the, there is no threat to China from the Chumbi Valley. In fact, the threat is to us. Okay. Because if we enter the Chumbi Valley, what do we do? That's not the gateway to Lhasa or anything else. There's no way. But if they enter the Chumbi Valley further southward, they threaten our security, our Siliguri corridor. So what is the need for China to build a military road in this area, which they haven't built since the occupation and annexation of Tibet? They haven't built this after 1962 even. They haven't built it even when the Depsang thing occurred, the Chumar incident occurred. They've been concentrating on infrastructure there uh, and activity there. They have never done this. So where is the need? What, what, what security interests of China are they protecting by actually building a road which gives them greater offensive capability. It's nonsensical. It's just is that uh, they miscalculated. Uh, they thought that they have, uh, that they have got away with the uh, provocations. Uh, they will get away with uh, this one and they overplayed their hand and they never expected India to intervene in this but manner. Was China waiting for a moment where India or Prime Minister Narendra Modi would get provoked and misread the situation and take some offensive which could which could put India on a tight spot. So were they waiting for that kind of a thing? And then they realized that this couldn't happen and so they had to back down? No, on the contrary. I mean, we, we took aggressive action. Frankly, we did. We put our troops there. We put our tents there, a few meters away from the Chinese tents. We brought in our bulldozer. And uh, we invoked uh, our treaty relationship with uh, Bhutan. Well, certainly it was a very strong military action on our part. So it's not, so why would China want to provoke that? So, and then lose face at the end of it. So it was absolutely uh, crucial for us to intervene at the moment we did to prevent 
they are very efficient road building crews from building roads, they can do it overnight. So, if you look at the way uh, India handled uh, this uh, Doklam standoff militarily and diplomatically, uh, are we then in a position to say that India actually has created a sort of a template on how to deal with China actually for the first time? No. No, 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 no. We, look, when the Debsang incident happened, we confronted the Chinese and uh, the established border mechanism and the agreements for border management were invoked and it was settled at that level. Then they provoked us in Chumar mm -hmm. when President Xi Jinping was being hosted by Prime Minister Modi. Uh, we moved our uh, troops there. In fact, we moved a large number of troops uh, to make it very clear to the Chinese that we are not going to accept uh, what they were doing. So it's not as if we haven't confronted uh, uh, China before on the border. And before that, if you recall in 1986-87, the Samdurong Cho incident, where actually we took very bold steps of uh, moving our a brigade of our, uh, of our uh, armed forces to confront the Chinese which had penetrated in that area. So there is a history to this. This is not the first time. But it's the first time that we have actually intervened in Bhutan. And that is the new thing in this, which, which they did not expect, the Chinese did not expect. And to that extent, it's a different order of India's self-confidence that uh, we were willing uh, to do this because through their action on Bhutanese territory, they were seeking to change the actual trijunction point to their advantage, which was contrary to the agreements not only signed between Bhutan, and China, but the 2020, 2012 uh, agreement between the two sides for understanding between the two sides at the level of the special representatives that the trijunction will be decided between India and China in consultation with a third party, which means Bhutan. So for, from what you're saying, I understand is that India actually has an upper hand at the moment. Uh, psychologically, yes, because uh, they have tried to assert themselves. and uh, but. In this scheme of things, how do nations like Pakistan react? Because obviously they were an all-weather ally to China. So what are the kind of reactions we are expecting from Pakistan? Obviously, obviously Pakistani media has not been very generous. Well, the Pakistani would have been absolutely delighted if India had buckled under Chinese threats and shown, and the Chinese have succeeded in showing India its place. Uh, because the Pakistanis are very happy with uh, China's ingress across the Himalayas into South Asia and becoming an active player in South Asia because that strengthens Pakistan's confrontation with us because then there is the China factor which boosts whatever they want to do vis-a-vis -vis India, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, but uh, from what I have seen a little of reactions from Pakistan on their TV and all, uh, their commentators seem to be very unhappy that uh, China did not implement its threats and uh, despite all this talk over so many weeks they'll teach India a lesson which will be worse than 1962. Uh, India is showing confidence and China is showing lack of confidence in taking India on. They're feeling very perturbed because for them this means a self-confident India which can take on China can even more effectively from tomorrow onwards take on Pakistan. So that's a lesson they are reading that India's Self-confidence is now sufficiently high for them to take risks of the kind which they were not earlier willing to take and which they can do vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan's uh, threats to us, which means that uh, the surgical strikes which we've not done uh, for some months now uh, can happen again and we can put more pressure on the border. If militarily India is, is, might not be in a very comfortable position to challenge China, but diplomatically, yes, and psychologically, yes, they have definitely uh, challenged uh, China's leadership and they made China look like a petulant nation. Uh, uh, that's how I would read. Well, first of all, let, let's not exaggerate. And this needs to be spelt out. Uh, China's superior military capacity is a yes. Yes, in totality, it is true The China is militarily stronger. It has developed an industrial manufacturing base within the country. Uh, they have developed uh, nuclear and missile capabilities. And uh, they, they have developed other te techniques of modern warfare, cyber 
warfare, everything else. Uh, however, the point is not that. In an all-out war, perhaps, yes. But if you are thinking in terms of what is the balance on the northern borders, our northern borders, I don't think China has the upper hand. On the contrary, uh, they have to operate on, in Tibet at those heights where the Air Force cannot function as well. And the lines of communication, despite all the infrastructure they have built, are very long. And uh, those lines of uh, communication, like for example, the railway can be taken out just like that by, uh, by our Air Force. And uh, how many divisions can they move and sustain in those horrible heights uh, through a long period of confrontation? They can't do it. Uh, and then the geographical train in the east is such, the, the mountains are north-south. They, can they can't penetrate right across the border. They have to come through the gullies, which can be defended, which are under our control. Uh, and yes, they have an easier time in the dark because it's plains. But we have taken dispositions on the border. So let me assure you, based on uh, very intensive uh, con conversations uh, that uh, I and some others have had with our military brass, both actual and retired, that uh, we need not fear uh, any serious military threat. And then finally, the Chinese are very vulnerable in the Indian Ocean. Uh, we dominate the Indian Ocean, their whole commerce and the energy supplies are through the Indian Ocean. So if they want to take us on, they have to worry a lot about their vulner vulnerabilities uh, on sea. So what happens now when BRICS summit starts on September 3rd? Uh, what are the kind of challenges we see going to unfold uh, at Jiamen then? Well, if you look at uh, the BRICS summit in Ufa and the BRICS summit in Goa, uh, China actually played a very negative role. And uh, all our core concerns, uh, especially in relation to terrorism, uh, could not figure in the joint statements. So on many of the issues, uh, China within BRICS uh, plays a role which is not in favor of our interests. Uh, now, when we go to Xiamen for this summit, my view is that uh, we should make sure that if our interests and our core concerns are not supported, that we should not allow any formulation uh, in, the, in the BRICS uh, joint statement which gives comfort to China, either on South China Sea and more importantly on the Belt and Road Initiative, which China would like to because it is Xi's pet project and they would like to promote it and pretend that uh, countries from three continents are supporting uh, his project. Russia, of course, does. Uh, so it's a, it's a challenge uh, before us how to handle the BRICS summit uh, in Xiamen because of uh, uh, China's uh, role. But apart from that, uh, the whole concept of BRICS emerged uh, as to fight a, out the Western hegemony. Uh, to try and dilute Western hegemony, to counter Western or American unilateralism, uh, to uh, uh, accept the principle of non interference in the in internal affairs of countries, respect for sovereignty of countries, uh, avoiding double standards, etc., etc. And that the developing countries has, should have much greater say in international political and financial institutions, etc., etc., uh, and the democratization of international governance. Now, on all these issues, you can take any of these issues, uh, China has a negative position. So, if China has a negative position, and obviously it's not adhering to all the objectives with which the BRICS Forum was formulated, so isn't China also at the same time, despite all its hegemonic ambitions, is also getting isolated amongst the nations? Not really. Okay. No, 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 no. Because China is the second largest economy in the world. It is the largest exporting country in the world crisis. today. It has a huge uh, trade relationships and investment relationship with all the major economies, beginning with the United States, but also Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, of course, the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, and uh, they're not the biggest uh, trading or investing partner of Europe as a whole. Uh, but if you, because Europe trades and invests internally, 
hugely and they have a huge relationship with USA. But China is a huge, huge partner of Europe. So those countries uh, are not going to get involved in uh, India-China uh, disputes on territory uh, and compromise their economic relationship uh, with China. So China has a lot of clout today uh, in international affairs. Uh, their economic strength has been converted into political strength. Look at our own neighbors, uh, the manner in which uh, they are opening themselves to China. They are supporting the Belt and Road Initiative, contrary to India's position. So let's not underestimate uh, China's role in international affairs. But China is getting away with it because of its economic strength. They, I mean, all of us in BRICS uh, take a position against Western hegemony, but it's so very clear that China has hegemonic ambitions in Asia. And this whole Belt and Road Initiative is actually calculated uh, to strengthen China's hegemonic role. Uh, the BRICS are against multipolarity, but China doesn't want a multipolar world. So obviously all eyes would be on how uh, India and China balance their strategic and economic no, but interests. Let me, let me compete that. China doesn't want a multipolar world because it wants to be one of the two poles, United States and China. So they're very ambitious. So it's a pleasure talking to you, sir. Thank you. So that's it on this episode of To The Point. See you next time with another personality. Goodbye and thanks for watching.